All right, welcome to our Microsoft Ignite edition of the uh, product development conversation slash webinar. We are here to talk about product development today, the ways that you can disrupt your industry, the ways that you can build a successful product development organization, and we're ready to get started. So uh, for introductions, my name is Nathan Lesnowski. I'm Concurrency's Chief Technology Officer. Microsoft MVP for 12 years. And then we also have Lewin. Lewin is a principal architect with modern, they are modern applications organization. He's also a Microsoft MVP. Why don't you just say hi, Lewin? Hey, everyone. I'm Lewin. Like uh, Nathan said, I'm also a MVP. I've been you know, a little less than Nathan, right? I've been an MVP in uh, MDEF area for uh, about uh, actually eight years, going to nine now. Eight years. Wow. That's awesome. All yes. right, so we are going to talk through product development today. You want to move on to the next slide yeah. here? There we go. There we go. Awesome. Great. So to kick this off, we're going to be talking about 10 ways that you can create your disruptive product. We're going to be talking about the strategy to disruption, the way you structure your team, and we really intend for this to set up a conversation, a workshop with each of you following this webinar today. So what we love to do is to spend time with you in teams working through a workshop as a group in multiple companies coming together to talk about product development, where they are in their organizations, how you move it forward, what your experiences have been. And we've seen a lot of success in companies being able to have that conversation. So our intent coming out of this is not a sales journey, it's to have a conversation about uh, driving what best practices are here and also creating workshops for you to be able to share your best practices and for us to be able to share best practices in a deep way around product development. And then also we want you to know about two upcoming uh, events, uh, not only the workshop that's coming up in the next following weeks, but then also we're going to be doing on December 1st, the best of Ignite 2021. Ignite is going on right now, and we would love for you to be able to see all the best things coming out of Ignite. We're going to spend a, a, a webinar on that topic and really talk about what are the exciting things that are happening. But without further ado, we're going to start talking about product development. So let her rip. Yeah, well, going through uh, a couple of things that Nathan talked about, right? We're going to look at strategy, development, and how the teams are formed. How do we deliver? and how to actually you know, have a rewarding uh, strategy that keeps working for all of us. And this is something that we use here at Concurrency. And this is something that, you know, that we recommend for all of our clients as well. And the successful clients that we are uh, interacting with, right, have a very similar strategy in terms of doing the, uh, the type of work that we, you know, I'll be showing you guys uh, today. So in terms of strategy, let's start, you know, there were uh, a few items that we want to actually talk about. And, you know, I will be actually going through that with Nathan together on some of these, right? Let's start with disruption of strategy and innovation first. Innovation, uh, classical definition, right? From from an Oxford London dictionary says that it is, uh, uh, you know, a method to idea uh, of creating new ideas or new things, right? Something that will actually create a new technological innovation or a new products that actually comes to market. It doesn't necessarily mean that it, you know uh, some of these are going to be a <coughs> Technological, some of these could be a thought process as well, right? That, that actually bring into a uh, obviously technological, you know, uh, switches within the uh, organization that you guys are running. One thing to keep in mind, right, when you're looking at innovation, we are looking at innovation versus production versus uh, ROI as well, right? Those has to come into effort. So when you look at innovation, we, you know, a lot of the time people actually look at innovation as a, you know, what do I get, right? How do I get to the best of my class? Uh, versus a desired performance, what people will pay for it, or what you know your team would like to see first, right? Which is meaning uh, things like MVP products, and of course, right, the thing that you're trying to do is beat the market. Uh, if there is a product that you're missing in your team, right, a solution, a software, it will be something that you are trying to complement to, so that you know, in this case, you know, meet the requirements or beat the requirements. Uh, that's one. The other is if you are actually looking at an outside, right, B2B or B2C, external facing applications and uh, products, then you want to make sure that those things are ahead of the game, right? Obviously, otherwise nobody's going to want to buy your stuff. So we got to actually look at those as well. In this case, I do want to stress two things, and I have an example of this, right? Uh, 
On the right-hand side, you have a state-of-the-art, you know, the, the new, uh, in this case, VMW that's coming out in 2023. And then on the on the right-hand side, right, we have a uh, Willys chip, right? Those are both innovation that came out, and those are both both type of innovation that actually, uh, you know, that, that actually exists in the marketplace. In the case of the Willys Jeep, right, they actually make the Jeep with minimalistic features, but the aim is to go to market quickly, right? They have a war to fight. They need to actually bring vehicles to that to these areas and transport people along, uh, around. And in this case, this takes them ahead of the game, quicker ahead of everybody else, right? When when uh, people couldn't get into you know certain areas of the jungles, right? This Jeep will actually get you there and and transport the people, right? Is it has it had amenities? Does it have, you know GPS and touch screens and all of this? Uh, no, right? It doesn't have it. Uh, you know uh, the seats are all bolted down. There is no cushioning on there, you know, et cetera. Uh, I've actually driven one of those things in my life, right? It it is there to actually beat the market. It's there to actually get ahead of the next guy. Whereas on the other side is the best in class, right? You're looking at all the amenities, the steering wheel that actually pulls you down and warm it up, right? And the fact that you can actually start the car remotely and it can actually take you, you know, through time by time navigations. So it actually, you know, there, there are different scales to innovation and we want to actually go through that as well, right? And we want to actually help you succeed, succeed in uh, creating these uh, innovative ideas. In order for us to innovate though, right? First thing that we have to actually look at is design. And the process that we actually have to look at is what is that the people want, right? We understand the you know uh, idea of what we want to actually grab, uh, understand the requirements, right? Empathies through interviews and personas, right? You know, what does uh, Lewin want? What does Nathan want? And what does your client want, right? In this case, you need to either be the client or talk to the client to understand what they are looking for. And then ideate through various different you know, uh, low fidelity, high fidelity sketches, et cetera, because you don't need to go through the design system. If at the end of the day, right, you can have the best looking coach, best looking team that actually creates an you know, awesome product, if nobody uses it and nobody understands how to use it, it you know, the, 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 the system doesn't work, right, at that point. So we want to actually make sure that you're, you understand, you ideate, you validate, and you build the system out. Some of this could be time consuming. Some of these we can actually, you know, uh, potentially skip an area, potentially, right, skip an area, and then come back and revalidate afterwards as well. However, we want to actually make sure that you do understand all of these uh, various design processes to understand that they actually go through these systems to make a product that works with you. So far, so good, right? Uh, let's talk about the steps of innovation. You know, in this case, a lot of people, right, talk about transforming and uh, disrupting the marketplace. Sometimes you don't get there right away, right? Sometimes you actually have to go through innovation in multiple different steps. A lot of us, you know, in a slower basis, will go through incremental innovation, slow, and changes that move up to the next level, right? And then sometimes it will be adapting to the next thing, right? The next set, and then sometimes you know it becomes a transformative innovation. Sometimes you can go from you know zero to one hundred. Sometimes you have to go through these scales. And let, let's talk about this for a second. We're in a pandemic, and uh, I've been watching a lot of TV right during the pandemic. And obviously, you know, there was no movie theaters to go to. So you know, watch TVs on you know YouTube's and uh, Netflix and Hulu's and so on and so forth, right? Let's talk about Netflix for a second. When you look at Netflix, right? Netflix didn't just come about and get to the stage where it is today. It actually went through a bunch of different, you know, uh, as a startup, right? It went through a bunch of different uh, phases. Initially, if you remember, right, all of us remember, Netflix was a direct competition to, you know, a familiar uh, logo that no longer exists, right? Blockbuster. Blockbuster was a you know, storefront. We go there, we buy, you know, we, we rent uh, DVDs and uh, movies, you know, cassettes, you know, et cetera, right? And uh, they innovated. Uh, from a bottom up, right? They actually come in as a, a, sm a smaller, you know, uh, uh, you know, boxes, right? In, in various different street corners, they were dispersing these red, you know, uh, jacketed um, um, movies, right? Initially, they started online and they actually went to a, a physical locations. They slowly, incrementally start eating up the market share of Blockbuster from the bottom up, right? And then as Blockbuster crumbled and fell, they get competition that came into the same place as well. 
they had to defend that marketplace at that point. You know, you got Hulu coming in, right? You got everybody else starting to get into the streaming marketplace. So from an incremental bottom up, uh, you know, innovation, they have to adapt themselves into a more of an adaptive, how do I survive, right? How do I actually make deals with, you know, Disney's and, you know, uh, MGM's and so on and so forth to, you know, put the content up on their side, right? So that's what Netflix did. Eventually, they had to actually, you know, innovate within themselves and eat and, and, and disrupt themselves, right? And by the, they did it by actually going into making their own original content. They just say, you know what, this industry, we need to actually go and eat it from inside and, you know, cut the middleman out, right? They actually went all the way from various different stages. So today, right, there are a lot of shows out there that Netflix actually create content that they actually own because they actually went through these different phases of it. And some of this takes a lot of guts, right, and a lot of thoughts to even even uh, self disrupt themselves. So they have to actually go through those. I think that's a We've seen that's that. a huge point is around the self disruption because of mm -hmm. how difficult it can be for a company to take an existing product they have and to bring something to market that to a degree competes with it, even to the degree to which like. Netflix competed with Blockbuster very low in the market with low features and low capability and being like having to wait for the DVD that gets shipped to me. Why would I ever want to wait for that? But mm -hmm. as that competition then replaced the the the, the feeling, the 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 normal normalcy of how I receive the DVD, they're used to not leaving their home. They move into instead of being content distributors, they become digital content distributors. Then become content producers. All of those required self disruption to occur, and not just disrupting the other company, but even inside the company having to take a risk. So that's a big learning that we have to think about when we think about product development. Yeah, you have to understand that sometimes the um, the, the work that you're going to do right is going to potentially offset the current income or current productivity that you're doing, but it's going to, at the end of the day, right, believe in yourself that you are actually going to get to the next phase, the next plateau through this uh, journey that you're going to be engaging in. I mean, this is not the first time it happened, right? It happened a number of times in the past too. It happened in the steel industries back in the day when you actually, you know, uh, back in the 70s, they had integrated steel mills that are huge giant mills that did everything, right? All the way from rebars to, you know, structural steels to sheet, you know, sheet metal and and you know, industrial structures, right? Uh, slowly over time, right? This is a this is a study uh, came from Harvard Business School. Uh, you know, slowly mini mills. These are the smaller you know units of uh, you know uh, items that actually get one thing and one thing well. That slowly came in and grabbed the market share, right? Uh, so in the in about 1975, they got a first mini mill came out in the market, and they could actually make rebar at a much cheaper rate, and they could make a gross uh, you know margins a lot higher, right? So they did. It's a similar story as in this case, right? Blockbuster and Netflix type of scenario, right? You got a bigger guys who are actually running the whole market, and the bigger people forgetting the market in this case because they're looking at rebar in their big plant, seven percent margin versus you know. So they said, well, we're making money up up on top. We can, you know, we don't mind losing that marketplace, right? And slowly, uh, this you know the, this process of innovation eat up and 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 you know churns and get bigger and bigger. Uh, and slowly the mini mills keeps moving up on the uh, on the scale, right? To a point where, to the, uh, at this point in time, I believe there's only one you know integrated mill left in the in this U.S. Everybody else is now switching into that type of you know smaller mini mill, uh, you know, very uh, integrated uh, from an integrated mills. Right. Same thing happened with Blockbuster, right? That we saw. So that takes us to this, right? When we look at it, there is a market share that you are looking at or your competition's market, right? It doesn't have to be competition. It could be internal, right? It could be something that we just talked about. It could, you know, some of some of this could be internal market as well. Sometimes when you're actually going over these two uh, blue and yellow, uh, sorry, blue and red areas, right? You will actually fight and you actually get into a, a, a giant massive, you know, people will actually defend the area. We'll talk about that in, 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 in the next step, right? However, people actually, you know, sometimes miss that non-consumption market, right? The area that, you know, we, we haven't thought of yet. In the case of Netflix, they had to make their own content, right? And at that point, they can grow into and the market becomes bigger. Same thing will happen to a lot of what you guys are going to do. 
right, in terms of applications or software or products you will be created. Sometimes you have to actually disrupt your own market or your own systems to get a next level, right? Data is going to be a big, you know, huge uh, play in this area. Data is going to be, you know, uh, helping guide us, right, with AI and ML and the kind of, uh, you know, innovation that will help uh, accelerate those uh, systems. But before we actually get to that, right, let's talk about one more thing that is highly important. It's communication. You need to actually have feedback loops that works and a frequent updates on feedback. Otherwise, it's not going to, uh, this, this, you know, this growth that you're looking for is not gonna happen, right? If you have mistrust, you need to have a radical candor, right? Current, you know, at, at, at concurrency, right? I can walk up to Nathan and say, hey, Nathan, this thing, that this process that we're creating could need, you know, improvement in such and such a way, right? And, and we will sit down and we'll openly discuss it. And we have this radical candor of like, hey, when something doesn't work, we can actually walk up and say, hey, this doesn't work. This is how we fix it. It becomes a open, you know, dialogue between all of us, right? The psychological safety. Uh, we need to actually make sure that we can trust each other, right? I, uh, you know, and, and we have that feedback that says that because I actually, you know, could question Nathan or anybody else, right? They are not going to come back and, you know, put me on a, on a, on a, on a you know, uh, doghouse, right? That needs to go away in order for us to succeed in this type of uh, scenarios. You agree, right, Nathan? Absolutely. Yeah, this think, is the type of, uh, you know, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say that I think that ultimately this this aligns to where the silos sometimes create mistrust and where mm -hmm. organizations create the mistrust and the competition internally in those silos. If they aren't open to what's good for the company, and they aren't innovating around what's good for the company, they get to a position where it it, it prevents innovation from occurring, right? They kill internal products. Actually, if you recall, Blockbuster had the opportunity to acquire Netflix and they didn't because of that internal competition, that feeling that it wasn't gonna make it or that it would disrupt my existing business flow. And I was just gonna keep innovating higher up on the value chain than where I am now. And instead, organizations that are able to have that open radical candor in the organization to be able to be willing to disrupt themselves requires trust within the parts of the organization that allow them to move forward. In fact, in a two degree, it feels like the, the segmentate the difference we've seen between the Balmer era and the Satya era at Microsoft. The Balmer era, you've seen these pictures with people are kind of holding these little guns to each other, right? Like, whereas the Satya era has really moved toward what's good for the company. How do we turn that into not only just good for the company, but how do we turn that into what's good for our customers? So communication is really at the heart of innovation. Yeah, and the, the right communication, the, the, you know, like we talk about it, the trust, that's huge. Now let's talk about how to actually create that trust and how to innovate using the right team, right? The next area we're gonna talk about teams, how do we acquire business, uh, how we acquire the knowledge, how do we actually work together as various different part-based teams, and uh, how agile methodology, right, can help us get to this innovation strategy a lot quicker. I'm not sure about you guys, right? A lot of the times we take uh, knowledge, especially in this day and age, right, where technology and the uh, speed of development is going at a at a lightning speed. We actually have to acquire new knowledge as constant to stay up to date. Some of us take classes. Some of us go to conferences and listen. Some of us present at conferences, Nathan, myself, right? You know, so on and so forth. Some of us look at blogs and videos and understand how certain things are done and uh, recreate it. And that's how we learn, right? Uh, those are very useful tips and those are very useful ways of us to increase our knowledge. At the same time, I also learn a lot and I'm, I'm discovering that a lot of our best uh, partners and you know companies that want to actually open up the door, right? Remove the silos, learn by using a uh, you know, slightly different uh, type of structure that we are you know, accustomed to developing. We actually use pod structures that allow us to create pods, right? Development pods that allow us to interactively work on various pieces of the puzzle and uh, create a solutions based on certain things that they are amazing, you know, uh, around you, right? For example, if you have a development part A that is actually, you know, uh, best at creating, let's say, uh, mobile apps, right? And development part B that is actually creating uh, security, you know, systems. The two of them can work together simultaneously to create 
various pieces of a solution. And uh, the way it works is that part A will do certain parts of it, part B will do you know, another set of uh, items together in the same project. And through that, through interactive knowledge transfer, right, through interactivity that the, the two parts will work together, we can actually transfer knowledge and we can actually show each other how, you know, for example, how, you know, if we are, if I'm bringing the DevOps part people, right, we can know how, how a deployment happens for uh, CI CD pipelines for development part A as well, so that, you know, both teams will actually understand each other. Additionally, right, uh, in the past, we have also worked as a, you know, uh, solution architects or, a, you know, various different mentoring on these parts as well with the client, right? So it becomes instead of um, um, the client actually, you know, and, and a lot of our partners will actually, you know, bring their developers and, and uh, their team members into our parts and actually, you know, try to learn from working together as well. So working together, open open dialogues and, and uh, bringing, you know, and, and having somebody else teach you, right, how certain things are done, breaking down these barriers will actually get your products done, you know, products development done a lot quicker with stronger understanding, right? For example, developers are usually used to developing. DevOps guys are used to making certain, you know, CI CD pipelines. If you actually have, you know, parts working together, you actually cross, uh, you know, learn from each other as well. Same thing happens like for data science. The best organizations are those that structure themselves into scalable success. And we, we uh, one thing that kind of builds on this that'd be interesting to listen to is we did a podcast with Alan Murphy over at Reinhardt, who talked about building pods in his development organization. Maybe on the Change Agent podcast, definitely go listen to that as a as a follow up to this topic, because creating scalable pods that are made up of internal teams, external teams, partner teams, maybe even mixtures of teams and being able to have the assets necessary to be able to meet your customers' needs. It happens fast and being prepared to be able to do that well in a scalable fashion, not just kind of what pulling a resource here and there, but knowing kind of how to, how to scale sets of people that work well together increases velocity and increases velocity of pr production of capabilities that are done in a way that has confidence. And yeah, and that also create that, you know, that that the trust and the, and the communication, right? Because now everybody is actually excelling in the area and, and they're creating that, you know, development cycle in a different way. Additionally, right, I also want to emphasize that all of this is based on the agile approach, right? Agile approach is also very similar to this whole new, well, it's not necessarily new, right? It's, it's a whole um, uh, item of, you know, things of fail fast and fail often. Uh, startup approach as well, right? It's, it's the simplest business plan that works. If you have an idea, does it work? You know, if it doesn't, you know, is it going to actually, you know, make money for us? We invest in the idea and then keep, you know, depending as well. Same thing is very, very similar, uh, you know, true with the agile development as well, right? You have an idea, you have a plan, design it, develop it, test it, deploy it. The biggest thing that you get from here, right, is the quick trusted feedback loops. You know, you need those things to actually make this, uh, Make your development process quicker. Make that process a lot, you know, before anybody else can do that, right? And you actually have a, you know, a quick turnaround um, understanding of how the system will work, so that everybody can actually move on a lot quicker and and um, and you know get to the systems that are usable, right, for everyone. Let's talk about delivery. How do we deliver this? Typically, right, most organizations are used to building a huge giant, you know, systems that works across, you know, uh, uh, various ecosystems. However, when you actually create, uh, you know, uh, monolithic or a giant, you know, uh, solutions, they tend to get bogged down by various different, um, you know, pieces of the puzzle, right? Especially with data and AI and a lot of the future coming along and, you know, giving us directions, right? A lot of successful organizations that we are working with as well are uh, getting into modular solutions, right? Things that are actually based on true data that we can actually manipulate, understand, right? Storage that actually stays either on-prem or on the cloud. We can talk about that later on as well. Uh, into various different micro uh, managed app services, right? It could be a microservice, it could be a different styling solutions that goes back to a similar backend data so that anybody can actually access that type of solutions. 
followed by a trusted API management or a you know a secure security layers that actually allows us to make sure that things like single sign-on works, right? Things like uh, CIAM and you know uh, secure various security pieces are tightened up, followed by a you know external facing applications or external outside of the uh, you know uh, system solutions that are interactive. That ties back to the very first point that we talked about, right? Unified design language, something that everybody's you know understand, right? When you look at in, you know uh, a Microsoft ecosystem, you see all of the fonts and all of the layers you know done a certain way, right? Same thing for an Apple ecosystem. Everybody has this very similar unified design language that we have to follow. You know your operation, your 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 system should do the same thing with the external facing you know uh, UI experience, right? whether it is a website or if it is the application, mobile applications or uh, even a you know desktop application, right? All of them should have, have a unified system and a theme that comes along. Then nobody's lost, right? And anytime you want to change something out, you can do that as well at that point. And you can actually you know, move a piece of the software or move move a piece of a solution and update it. And that gives us ways to actually quote unquote go back to that product teams, right? The development teams and change features out as well a lot quicker for all of us. Which takes us to uh, DevOps, right? Everybody screams about DevOps for a while. There is a true feeling of the fact that we actually now believe in multi-cloud, right? Everybody's actually very, very cloud conscious. You want to make sure that your system will scale on, uh, make, you know, on Azure, right? As well as any other system on-prem or otherwise. DevOps allows us to do that, right? It allows us to actually deploy to multiple different places. We also allow us to actually do things like multiple, you know, uh, uh, testing, right? Between A-B tests and switches back and forth automatically through a press of a button. Automatic testing uh, as we deploy application and code, right? Not only do we, uh, you know, developers test and automators, we go through automation tests and UI tests and all the other stuff. We can actually test all of it through the uh, development pipeline. When something doesn't work, the bugs get tracked down and get fixed before they actually get published on a, on a feature. So, you know, systems that you actually create, right? Product as a code, services as a code, deployment as a code, all of those are, are solid for, you, you know, anybody who sees it your client, your customers, yourself, right? Everything is set up and flushed out properly. It's the way we would actually, you know, recommend. And that's the way we would actually, what we, you know, we deploy everything now. That, you know, and also using cloud to scale, right? A lot of the people will actually start moving from their on-prem data centers or from a, uh, you know, various different uh, systems and solutions, uh, such as, you know, uh, things like, uh, you know, SQL servers on cloud, uh, on prem, moving into the cloud, right, and scaling it out that way, and and beyond, right. SQL is just a small example of, uh, you know, uh, you know, various pieces of of the puzzle. The good news is this, right? You're not actually getting rid of the workforce. You're taking your current workforce and you're actually giving them a new training set, a new skill set to actually expand into the workforce in a, in a bigger, stronger manner, right? That way, you can actually take the current people who are maybe fetching a system. You no longer have to actually use a batching job. Now you can actually, you know, train these people, and they can actually get into how do I scale this thing quicker, right? How do I actually make it more resilient, you know, in the in the cloud environment? So we get, you know, it's it's a it's a, it's a rethinking of the workforce as well. You can scale it, push the button, right? Instead of actually going out and buying new hardware, you can actually press the button, and you can actually say, hey, at a certain time, I have uh, solutions that are needed to go up, uh, you know, during that demand, and then when I'm done with it. I can bring it back down, right? Cost conscious. Security and trust are always there, right? Somebody will always patch for your system. If it is on Azure, Microsoft will patch. Information is there for you to actually understand and you know build upon it so that you can actually get faster, right? Understand how your system works quicker as well. So you have an end-to-end -end understanding of how do you start the project, how the team was created it, and how you're deploying it and how you're scaling it up and down as needed, right? There's a whole complete solution that comes along. And the best part about this is the rewards that you come out of it. By that, I mean, because of the way you're actually using code re, uh, uh, reuse and you know re, uh, debt reduction, right? Through team integrations, through uh, understanding of the various system components and moving everything to modular application structures, right? It's actually going to give you guys access to, you know, physically, Reusing code, reusing various different uh, architectures again, various different pipelines, right? That's trusted that you actually went through. 
and security that is trusted, right? Once you actually figure out how you do one of these things, you can actually reduplicate these systems at scale at that point. It will actually get you get your know, next, you know, uh, next solutions, right, quicker. Next solution that actually get you ahead of your clients or ahead of your customers or demand, right, a lot, a lot sooner as well. Now you have your roadmap uh, created, and you can actually get to the, you know, your, your teams can actually get uh, situated a lot sooner as well for the next challenges that come along with it. So that's how we actually, you know, take these 10 various different pieces to make them make a new, new whole new product cycle. Anything else to add, Nathan? No, I think I think you hit it on the head that really the reason why you build in modular architectures and the reason why you use DevOps is because of the downstream effects of mitigating tech debt and putting you in a position to be able to accelerate velocity in, an, in a confident way to bring capabilities to your customers. The cust companies that I see that are doing red, green, blue testing, the ones that are able to roll out uh, releases on a weekly basis are the ones that have built this kind of infrastructure. The ones that haven't are the ones with the two to three week change windows that take you know, all these people to approve and all these steps that doesn't even bring confident deployments. So this results really in a modern deployment and capability attached to the products that you're building. Yeah, we get these products that come out, right? Every single time they're solid and they're ready to go and they're tested proven at, at that point as well. Absolutely. All right, let's talk about the next uh, couple of things that are happening. All right, so from a next step standpoint, we would love for everyone who attended this, or even if you didn't attend this, to come to the workshops attached to product development. That it will be small group workshops, multiple companies talking about these best practices in a much more deep way, expanding upon them, talking about them, talking about your strategies and how we can learn from each other. Don't miss them, make sure you sign up right away. Get in that, uh, and, and also if they know someone who's interested in product development, who didn't have the opportunity to attend this particular webinar, we've, we will have this recorded, they can watch it ahead of time and then participate in the workshop so we can really open up the box and figure out what, where, where we go next as companies. Don't miss our December 1st, Best of Microsoft Ignite. So many awesome announcements this week. I mean, I think uh, of, of the ones that I've seen in a while, this Ignite has really been talking about some interesting topics, so do not miss that. And of course, uh, don't forget the recording of this as well as other webinars you've done historically that would be assets to you. Have a great day, and thank you again, Lewin, for uh, really walking us through an excellent discussion on product development. Thank you for having me. Bye, everyone.